Now, just as we've seen with carbocations, different radicals have different levels of stability. And in fact, they follow the exact same trend. I've taught you in the past that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary carbocations. Similarly, tertiary radicals are more stable than secondary radicals, which are more stable than primary radicals, which are more stable than methyl radicals. Now, I've told you in the past that methyl carbocations and primary carbocations are so unstable that they essentially don't really exist except possibly in interstellar space. That is not true of methyl and primary radicals. They are more stable than methyl or primary carbocations, and hence can exist transitorily in certain circumstances. Now, what consequence does this ultimately have? Well, what it means is that when I take an alkane like this, I could potentially traverse a mechanism that would give me the chlorine attached to one of the primary ends of this butane, or I could attach the chlorine to one of the internal carbons, as shown here. As it turns out, both of these occur, but keeping in mind that to get to this chlorine that is attached to a primary carbon, it has to traverse a primary radical, whereas putting the chlorine on an internal carbon traverses a secondary radical. That explains why we see the secondary substituted product as being the major product, because it goes through the more stable intermediate, the secondary radical versus the primary radical. Which brings us to a lecture problem. I want you to write the mechanism for the formation of carbon tetrachloride from the reaction of methane with chlorine gas and light. Now, as I'm going to show you the answer momentarily, if you wish, you're welcome to pause the video now and first attempt it on your own. So here's the overall reaction. Converting methane, this molecule here, to carbon tetrachloride using chlorine gas and light. How in the world does that proceed? Well, as I've showed you before, the first step is initiation. I've got my chlorine gas, and each of these separate chlorine atoms takes one of these two electrons to itself, as indicated here using these half barb arrows, to form two separate molecules of chlorine radical. This is the initiation step. What happens next? Well, what occurs is one of these chlorine radicals will combine with one of the hydrogens on my methane gas radically, as shown here. We've got all these half barb arrows. This is, of course, going to form HCl and give me a methyl radical, as we can see here. This is a propagation step, because I've got a radical on both the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation. What occurs next? Well, next what we see is this methyl radical getting together with a second molecule of chlorine radical, as shown here, to form our methyl chloride. We've now successfully replaced one of the original hydrogens in my methane with a chlorine. This is a termination step because we have radicals on the left side of the equation and we have no radicals on the right side of the equation. So how in the world do I go all the way from this methyl chloride to my carbon tetrachloride? What occurs is step one, the initiation step, repeats and then one of those chlorine radicals abstracts one of these hydrogens down here to form another radical on this carbon. The second molecule of chlorine then comes in and plops right in there to now put two chlorines on this carbon. And then the process repeats itself two more times for a total substitution of four chlorine atoms for four hydrogens in the original methane gas. If you want to, I'll let you draw that out. So this brings us to another lecture problem. I want you to show the major products formed by reacting each of the following with bromine, Br2, and light. Once again, you're welcome to pause the video at this point, because I'm totally going to show you the answers momentarily. I should point out, though, that I'm not going to show you answers to all of these, but just a couple key ones, and let you do the rest on your own. So let's go ahead and begin. For every single one of these problems, the first step is going to be the bromine-bromine bond in Br2 separating out homolytically, like this, to form two individual atoms of bromine radical. That is the initiation step. We'll now take a look at what occurs when I treat this molecule with the bromine radical. In principle, this bromine radical could remove any hydrogen on this entire ring or on the CH3. The hydrogen that's going to remove most prevalently, however, is going to be the one that's attached to the most substituted carbon, as we see here. 
which ultimately gives rise to HBR and radical disposition. The reason that this occurs at this position is because a tertiary radical is more stable than a secondary or primary radical. Thus, this is the major pathway by which this reaction proceeds. In the next step, this radical is going to react with a second molecule bromine radical to form a bromine carbon bond, giving us this as our major product. As I delineated earlier, the bromine ends up at the most substituted carbon in the major product. And the reason is because it has to traverse the most substituted radical, which will be the most stable. With that knowledge as background, I'll let you now do the rest of these on your own. Okay, so I think this seems like a great place for us to stop today's video on radical chemistry. Of course, there's going to be more coverage on this subject, so please stay tuned for my next video in which I will continue our discussion of this topic. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.